Hey guys, Dr. J here. I wasn't really planning on making this video, but after finishing the modded run, I wanted to give the Radiant difficulty bosses a try. And it turned out they were very doable and actually a lot of fun. So I spent some time practicing on them and decided to make a quick little tutorial video. I am by no means an expert and this is just how I beat those bosses. Of course, there are other viable strategies and builds you can use. I will show you the fights in the order they appear in the Pantheon of Hollow Nest. This is not representative on the difficulty as the fights are vastly different when you have to do them hitless. It is still a nice order of progression though. First, let's talk about the charms. Obviously, all defensive charms are out of the question. You are free to overcharm as well. In fact, you should overcharm. This basically means you have two types of builds. A melee build and a range build. Except for the Sly fight, I was exclusively using a melee build. But a spell build is also very much viable. The charms I'm using are the Fragile Strength of course, the Mark of Pride, the Quick Slash and the Soul Eater charm. While this is a primarily melee build, spells are still very useful and I try using them at every opportunity. The nature of the melee build creates an incredible synergistic effect with the Soul Eater charm, so we'll have more than enough soul generation to be able to use spells frequently. Keep in mind the Grubberfly's Elegy Charm, as it can replace the Soul Eater Charm and create a kind of a quasi-ranged build. You'll be losing on a lot of DPS, but it will make certain fights much easier. With all of that out of the way, let's start with the fights. And please stick around until the end for a surprising reward for defeating all 44 Radiant bosses. Oh, I've also forgot to mention that I've slowed down the video a bit, so I have enough time to talk. The fights go by really quickly. First up is the Bench Fight King. Now the Bench Fight King is not a difficult boss fight. If you're patient and only attack them during their swoop attacks, you'll probably beat them first try. There is another much faster tactic though. You can pogo them and with some precise dashes you can follow them to the side while continuing with the pogo jumps. This will make the fight so much shorter. It is quite risky though since you have to time your pogo jumps very precisely because you'll be largely off screen. But that's also a good bit of training for the Absolute Radiance's sixth phase as well. I was almost able to kill both of the Vengeful Eye Kings in one go, but my third Vengeful Spirit spell missed, so I wasted a couple more seconds until he swooped again. Next is the Gross Mother. She's pretty easy, but you still have to watch out for her slam attack and the fact that there are several spike pits and only three little platforms doesn't help. Once she's done with her slam attack, it's a great moment to use a few abyss shrieks on her in order to make the fight go a bit faster. Just be careful she doesn't bump into you while casting the spell. The false knight is a little bit more difficult, but still nothing you should worry about too much. His attacks are predictable and easy to avoid. To make your life a bit easier, you can use a couple of dream nail slashes when he's down, before attacking the maggot itself. Once he gets up, you can use the beast shriek before he starts his rampage attack, or stay back and use some vengeful spirits as well as hit the falling rocks at him.
keep in mind that you can't simply keep on dream nailing him, since you need to actually damage the maggot in order for the fight to progress, and not restart the previous phase. There are no changes to his attack pattern during the different stages, so just rinse and repeat a couple more times and he's done. Don't forget about the falling rocks though, if they hit you, they'll still kill you. I was barely able to deflect that last one. Next we have the massive moss charger. With my current charm build, it's a completely free fight. Just stand there and see what attack he uses. If he charges at you, you just have to keep slashing until he dies. His only other attack is when he jumps, but you only need to avoid that one and wait until he charges. Now we'll face Hornet in her Protector variant. I thought it would be a difficult fight and it's not an easy one by any means, but it's also not that bad. She is fast, but her attacks are not difficult to read and very easy to dodge. Personally, I prefer to be constantly in her face since she seems to fight more defensively than. She's surprisingly tanky, but it still won't take too long before she goes down. Gorp can be very annoying with his constant teleporting. If you're using a ranged build, it will be somewhat easier to deal with him. For a melee build, you have broadly speaking two options. One is to wait for him until after he's finished his attack and shadow dash through the needles. Or do what I'm doing and pogo jump him while avoiding the needles. Obviously pogo jumping him would be much more difficult, but it's also much faster and will give you plenty of soul to use on spells to make him go down even faster. Next is the Dunk Defender. This can be a somewhat long fight, depending on how aggressively you're fighting him. The main issue is the slash during his Dunk Toss attack, which is the best time for attacking him. Apart from that, his short Dunk Dive can catch you off guard if you're not careful. This is why I always use Shadow Dash at him when he's diving. If it's a short dive, I'll be behind him and in a great position to deal some damage. He doesn't really have any other attacks that are a threat to you. Everything else is just about maximizing your damage during his other moves. The Soul Warrior is another relatively easy fight. All of his attacks are heavily telegraphed and easy to dodge. The only possible way you may get hit is if a folly spawns at your location. But as long as you're careful, you shouldn't have any problems. Descending Darks is an awesome spell to use in this fight, as it will also clear any follies that have spawned. Other than that, there is no particular strategy you need to use in order to defeat him. Just keep dodging his attacks and keep hitting him until he dies. He's only got 1000 HP so it shouldn't take too long.
Brooding Molek is a bit more difficult than the previous bosses, mainly because of his vomit attack. He's constantly spewing blobs of corrosion, but they shouldn't be too difficult to dodge as long as you keep an eye on them. You also have to watch out for his claw attack whenever you're in melee range. And he also likes to jump around quite often. All in all, there are a lot of things to look out for, so it may take you a couple of tries until you defeat him. and we're really starting to ramp up the difficulty now. Oro and Matu are quite tough on Radiant's difficulty. The first phase, when it's only Oro, is very easy. You shouldn't have any problems taking him down. He's only got 800 HP and all of his attacks are easy to dodge. The real fight starts after his brother makes his entrance. In a way, it's similar to the Watcher Knights fight as you also have to fight against two strong enemies at the same time. Unlike the Watcher Knights though, Oro and Mato have more varied attacks that you have to keep track of. I found it's best to stand between them as much as possible as doing that will force them to make their combo attacks and their combo attacks come in only two flavors, either a jump slash or two normal slashes. Both are easy to dodge and after dodging the jump slash it's a great opportunity to punish them with either your slashes or some vengeful spirits. Don't forget you can also use Descending Dark as a get out of jail card if you're in a bind. Overall, as long as you don't allow yourself to get cornered, you should be able to defeat them without too much problems. Next comes Zero. On lower difficulties, this is an extremely easy fight. In Radiant, however, it's so much more difficult. His spikes can be extremely annoying to deal with. After a few attempts, I simply yelled it and fought very aggressively. The moment I generated enough soul to fuel all my soul tanks, I started using consecutive Abyss Shrieks. Zero moves around a lot, but he does not teleport so the Abyss Shrieks were absolutely devastating. The Crystal Guardian remains the same free fight as it always was. His two attacks are very easy to dodge and you can kill him extremely quickly. Something I didn't think of at the time was using the Sending Dark while he's firing his beam attack. Using the Sending Dark will make the already short fight even shorter. The Soul Master is not so much a difficult fight as it is a long one, due to him constantly teleporting. Using spells in this fight is not really worth it as you won't often have an opportunity to actually hit him with them. Still, his attacks are not particularly difficult to dodge, so as long as you try to constantly dash at him and manage to hit him at every opportunity, you shouldn't have too much problems with him. Something that you should keep in mind is that his homing orbs will despawn if you shadow dash through them. Note that you often have to worry about them since they're easy to dodge. Once you manage to push him to his second phase, the fight is pretty much over. Just dash around while he's doing his dive bombing attacks, 
and then finish him off while he's casting the homing orbs. You still have to keep track of the homing orbs since they will hit you if you just stand around doing nothing, but they're quite slow. The old Wobble's fight feels even more like a bullet hell in Radiant difficulty. The fact that you have to do it hitless just adds that extra bit of pressure. If you want to be completely safe, you can wait until they're not firing blobs before closing in and attacking them. It will however take an extremely long time to kill them this way. In any case, the Abyss Shriek works absolute wonders in this fight. Especially if you manage to hit both of them at once, which shouldn't be too difficult to pull off. Just make sure you're not hit while casting. The Mantis Wards in Radiant difficulty should play out pretty much the same way as in lower difficulties. Their attacks are heavily telegraphed and easy to dodge. The only one that could pose some problems is the Boomerang attack. However, there is an easy way to find out the path of the Boomerang just by watching where exactly on the wall the Mantis is clinging. You can also pogo jump them while they're stuck to the wall, which will make it both easier to dodge their attack and make the fight shorter. Also, don't forget that you can pogo off of the whirling side as well. This shouldn't really matter too much in this fight, but will be a much more important skill to learn in the Sisters of Battle version. Another thing you may want to start practicing is using the Descending Dark when they're using their horizontal dash attack. It's not necessary in this fight, but will help you immensely in the next one. The bosses that have different forms use the same pedestal, but can be changed either by dream nailing the dream symbol or by slashing the lever. The first phase will be exactly the same as in the previous fight. Use this time to generate soul and fill all your tanks completely. Once all three of the sisters join the fight, things will become extremely hectic. You really have to be careful on how you react to their attacks. If they use the dive charge, you can easily punish them with your nail. Against the horizontal charge, it's best to use the descending dark spell, as it will cause massive damage to everyone on the platform, and will make you invulnerable, which will help a lot since you most likely get dive charged by one of the sisters. If they use their boomerang attack, just dodge it and concentrate on the third sister. Do not attempt to poggle them on the wall. It's almost guaranteed that the third sister will use her dive charge while you're poggoing. Once you're used to the flow of the battle, it's not a terribly difficult fight and it's actually a lot of fun. After defeating one of the sisters, it's pretty much over. Thanks to the descending dark splash damage, the other two will likely be near death as well. And in any case, the fight becomes way easier since you won't have to worry about as much attacks.
Next is Marmu. This is an almost free fight. You do need some decent reflexes, but this fight is basically playing Arcanoid with Marmo as the bow. There's really nothing much else to do. You could also simply not move and just time your slashes since she will always come directly at you, but I find it easier to just move below her and use the upward slash. Fluke Marm is slightly more difficult. I still think that Pogo jumping her to death is the best strategy, but you have to be really careful of the flukes she constantly spawns. They follow a very predictable flight pattern and if you can find the sweet spot above the fluke marm, you won't really have to dodge them too much. If that doesn't work out for you, another viable strategy is using the Grubberfly Selegy charm. But you still have to watch out for the flukes. The broken vessel can be quite difficult. I found it works best if you're ultra aggressive and stick constantly to him while continuously slashing. The only attack you really have to watch out for is his eruption move. All of his other attacks are fairly easy to dodge since there's plenty of windup that gives you enough time to figure out what he's going to do and dodge it. Galian should be an easy win. He is not moving around too much and his sights are not particularly hard to dodge. Since he's mostly close to the ground, I like to open the fight with heavy melee attacks and finish him off with a beast shriek once I fuel my soul tanks. Paint Master Shio has quite varied attacks, which is really the main difficulty in this fight. If you have good eyesight though, you can figure out what attacks he's going to make based on the change of color of his paintbrush. Apart from that, nearly all of his attacks are based around filling the screen with blobs of paint. As long as you're able to avoid them, you'll be fine. The only other attack that you have to watch out for is the yellow spear that can span through the entirety of the screen. The only way to avoid that one is by jumping above it. Thankfully it has a huge windup so there's plenty of time to react. The only spell that's worth casting is the vengeful spirits and that's only if you're using a spell build. All the others take way too much time and leave you vulnerable to Sheol's attacks. There's only one thing you need to worry about in the Hive Knight fight. The rain of bees that comes after he vomits them. It is extremely easy to bump into one of them since there are quite a lot and the rain continues for a while. Other than that, all of his attacks are heavily telegraphed so there's little risk in sticking to him and constantly slashing him. It won't take long before he's defeated. Also, don't worry about dying after you've defeated an opponent. I've had this happen to me several times and as long as his flag is defeated, you'll be fine even if you die. 
The Elder Who fight handles exactly the same in Radiant difficulty as it does in the lower ones. You shouldn't ever get hit by his bracelet attacks as they are very easy to dodge. A properly timed shadow dash will get you safe at any point of the fight. The real question is how much time he will waste and that all depends on how many times he'll do his ring curtain attack. Other than that, the Abyss Shriek is a good spell to use even though he's moving around quite a lot. The Collector is also the same in Radiant difficulty. The only thing you should watch out for are his quick jumps. They may easily catch you off guard if you're not careful. The enemies he throws down in the jars are very easy to kill with a melee build and can be largely disregarded. Except for the Primal Aspid, that one should be killed as quick as possible since his ranged attacks can be very annoying. Thankfully all of them should go down in one hit so by the time he's back down in the arena you have plenty of time to finish all the ads. Still, he's quite tanky, so it will take a while before you're able to finish him off. The Guts Tamer is not really a 2 on 1 fight despite how it looks. The only thing you need to defeat is the Beast. The Tamer herself rarely attacks and you can largely ignore her. The way I did this fight with a melee build is by standing in front of the Beast and slashing him until he curls up and then baiting him to home on me in a position away from the Tamer. His homing attack is easy to dodge, so I just repeated this pattern until he dies. After that, the tamer will simply give up. Grim is an extremely long and annoying fight mainly because of his pufferfish attack. It seriously messes up my tempo, which makes me prone to stupid mistakes. Unfortunately, there's no getting around that. You simply have to be patient and deal with his attacks as they come. You cannot be aggressive in this fight. It's all about dodging his attacks and then retaliating. I'll break down his attacks and how you can punish them. During his fire bats attack, you simply jump over them and towards him. He sends three fire bats, after which you can slash him two or three times. For his dash uppercut, you can use a downward slash while jumping over him during the first part of the attack, and then turning around and using one more slash when he makes his uppercut. During his dive dash, you can do the same, but in reverse order. But realistically, I could only attack him during the dash portion of the move. His last attack is the clock spikes. If you're near him when he does that attack, you could melee him, but it's quite unlikely you have this opportunity. However, this is a great time to use the Shade Soul spell. You could squeeze two casts and then Shadow Clock, and if you're close enough, you can even manage a single slash. Basically, this fight is all about maximizing the limited opportunities you have for dealing damage. Next we have the Watcher Knights. I had quite a lot of problems with this fight. It is very long and through most of it you'll be fighting two enemies at once. The first one is easy enough. Although they're relatively tanky, their attacks are not particularly difficult to avoid. The trouble really starts when two of them spawn. 
Because they're invulnerable while they're doing their rolling attacks, it is very easy to get clipped by them, especially if one is doing a bouncing roll and the other a ground roll. After a few attempts, I tried concentrating my melee attacks on a single knight and only attacking the other with shade souls when I can hit both at the same time. This gave me enough time to deal more damage to the remaining one while the next knight is waking up. So for a significant amount of the fight I was only dealing with one at a time. You could also try using Descending Dark when they're using their rolling attacks, but I couldn't figure out the timing correctly and ended up getting hit quite frequently. Whatever you do, do not get cornered by them or stand between them for long. Try to keep them clumped on one side of the arena. And once you're down to the last Watcher Knights, the fight is basically over. There's pretty much nothing he can do to hurt you. Ok, and now it's time for Umu. This is actually the fight that took me the most attempts. Not because it's that difficult, but like I said during the green fight, I hate losing my tempo. And while the puffer fish attack is annoying, it's at least predictable. But the Oma spawns are, as far as I know, random, and it's very annoying to have to lead Umu near them since I've had so many times their core hitting the platform since that. Eventually, I got a fight with 3 lucky spawns that finished him off very quickly. But I never want to deal with him again. I have only 2 pieces of advice for this fight. Use the Dream Nail in the beginning in order to get some soul, and then line up Umu and an Alma so you can hit them both with a Shade Soul, and the core will almost certainly hit Umu. Nosk is a very simple boss fight, though not necessarily an easy one. We don't have a platform in this arena, so we can't use that strat, but I wouldn't recommend it in a hitless attempt anyway. Regardless of the build, the strat we're going to have to use is very simple. If he charges at you, jump over him and use a downward slash so you both damage him and generate some soul. After that, turn around and use some Shade Souls. And if he starts spewing blobs of corrosion, you simply need to avoid them, which is not particularly difficult, despite me getting hit by it. Winged Nosk fights almost exactly the same as Vengefly King. The only difference is he also likes to spew blobs, which makes the strat of Pogwing him not really viable. But since he also swoops much more often, that's not really a problem. My way of killing him is by waiting for a swoop, downward slashing once, then dashing in the direction he's going, doing another downward slash, and then finishing with a Shade Soul. Once you get the rhythm going, it's very easy to perform, very safe and makes the fight go relatively fast. It's still a somewhat long fight, so you need to be patient and not do anything too risky.
Sly is another boss that took me way more attempts than reasonable. Mostly because of his second phase. After trying many different builds, I finally settled on using the Grubberfly Salagy. But even that didn't help until I figured out that the key to defeating him in the second phase is by baiting his whirlwind attack, shadow dashing away and then attacking him. I was extremely worried that his constant zooming around will hit me if I'm not far away from him. But he'll actually stop moving the moment you're in the range of his attack, so you won't have to worry about bumping into him. I'm not commenting on the first phase of the fight since Grubberfly's allergy makes it completely free. You only have to watch out for his nail arts, but some of them are heavily telegraphed and can be avoided by simply climbing one of the walls. And I've also found out this funny glitch that dupes his nail. Doesn't make any difference in the fight though. Ok, so now we just sit in the center of the arena, wait until he attacks, dash away and start slashing at him. He still has quite a lot of HP left, so it will take a while. But if you're using these strats, there's no way you're going to lose. Hornet Sentinel, similarly to her previous form, is not a difficult fight, and it really pays to be super aggressive. The only move you may want to be wary of is her counter-attack stance, since you could activate it if you're too focused on slashing at her. Other than that, she may use her spike attack and leave a few mines, but you can easily clear them with a descending dark spell. The Enraged Guardian is literally the same fight as the Crystal Guardian. It's still a free win and again, the only thing you need to do is slash him to death and use a Descending Dark spell when he's firing his beam laser. He's quite a bit tankier, so it will take you slightly longer, but it's still a very short fight. The Lost King is also very similar to his previous incarnation. Again, the only thing you have to really worry about is his eruption attacks, but otherwise try to stick as close as possible to him. Also be careful since he really likes to jump, so it's best to mainly stick to the ground so you don't bump into him. The Lost Skin is quite tanky, so it may take a while to finish him off, but otherwise it's not a difficult fight.
No ice was already a very difficult fight, but having to do it hitless is absolute nightmare. It didn't take me too many attempts, but to be honest I was extremely lucky. I barely didn't die at several points during my successful attempt. There is no particularly clever strategy for this fight. The most important thing is to be patient since she teleports a lot. You could simply choose to stay on one of the platforms and wait for her to come to you. I'm not the patient type however, so I had to constantly chase after her. The Abyss Shriek can be quite useful as you often be below her. Other than that, there's not much you could do. The Traitor Ward was a surprisingly easy kill. He has a very limited selection of moves and all of them are very easy to dodge and very punishable. I was actually able to kill him first try and didn't even see his screen wide attack. But that's pretty much the only one you should be slightly wary of. The White Defender is pretty much the same fight as the Dung Defender. He's quite a bit more tanky and has a couple more attacks, but overall your strategy should stay the same. The most dangerous attacks are the ones where he creates spikes from the ground. If he punches the ground, the spikes appear only in the short radius around him, so you should simply dash away from them. If he dives into the ground however, the spikes will spawn the entire arena, so you should either go above them or shadow dash through them. The Soul Tyrant is also very similar to the Soul Master and the fight plays mostly the same way. One important difference is that when he uses the attack that spawns several orbs orbiting around him, you have to shadow dash through them in order to be absolutely safe. You can follow this up with a couple of Shade Soul casts since he'll be locked in moving and won't be able to dodge them. Another attack you should be wary of is his fake out dive bomb, that can catch you off guard if you're already in the air. Something I should have done in this fight is use the descending dark when he starts his hover through the arena. With a not very hard to pull off timing of the cast, you'll be able to both iframe his contact damage and deal a lot of damage on him. Other than that, just be patient and only attack him when it's safe to do so. Before long you'll be able to push him into the second phase. Do keep in mind that his dive bombs come a lot quicker than when he was simply the soul master. You have to basically start running and dashing the moment you see him appear above you. Since he's quite a bit tankier, you may not be able to finish him off before he starts his dive bombing again. But don't worry about that too much. It's better to waste a few seconds while he's dive bombing you again, than do something too risky and get hit by one of the orbs.
Markot is another boss that was extremely easy to defeat on lower difficulties, but becomes a huge pain in the ass when doing hitless. You have to track so many things at once. His constant nails barrage, his shields orbiting around him, and Markot himself likes to move quite a lot. It doesn't help that you only have a few small platforms to stand on. There is nothing much to be said about him. The only way to defeat him is by practicing and having a bit of luck. In this attempt I was very lucky since his shoot hit me right after I managed to land the final blow. Grey Prince's assault was also a very difficult fight, but not in an annoying sort of way, unlike his real life personality. Pretty much all of his attacks result in some kind of shockwave. He's pretty fast and absolutely unpredictable. There's almost no way of knowing what he's going to do before he does it. The only thing you can do is practice this fight a lot and learn how to react to his attacks. He's also very tanky, so there's no way to burst him down quickly. But this is still a very fair fight with very little RNG. So it's all up to you to learn it well, and once you do, you'll be able to finish him off very easily. The Felt Champion is pretty much the same as usual. He's faster than the False Knight, but his attacks are basically the same. It's still a good idea to Dream Nail him twice when he's knocked down, and use the Soul to cast a few Shade Souls while he's rampaging. Don't forget that before he starts his rampage, you can hit him a few more times with your Nail. The only other thing you have to watch out for is his jumps. You shouldn't be in the air at any point of the fight, so whether he jumps or not shouldn't be an issue. But he's quite fast, so try not to get caught off guard. I actually found Nightmare King Grim easier to fight than the regular Grim. But again, this all comes down to having to keep the same tempo throughout the fight. Overall, NKG leaves you a bit more opportunities to damage him, despite his attacks being a lot more dangerous. His Flame Pewers attack is a great time to get a few hits in, and the Fire Bats are even easier to dodge. When he's using the flame pewers, try to space them so you're near him when he starts his last one. This will give you enough time to hit him a few times. For his fire bats, just start moving towards him and then jump above the second one. After that, shadow dash through the final fire bat. When properly timed, this will place you in a perfect position near him. You still have to wait for his puffer fish attack 3 times during the entire fight, but since it's otherwise extremely fast paced, I've never lost the rhythm. Also, it helps if you fight NKG right after regular Grim, since you still have your muscle memory. While generally you have more opportunities to attack him simply because he's so aggressive, 
you won't be able to punish his clock spikes attack, since he completely disappears from the arena while doing it. It's still a very long fight since he has a lot of health, but he keeps doing the same moves over and over, so as long as you don't lose your concentration, he's got nothing to surprise you with. Ok, so this is his last puffer fish attack, which means he only got about a quarter of his health left. That sure took a while, but we're finally done with Grimm, and there are only a couple more bosses left. It's always a great pleasure to go against the pure vessel. The fight is pretty difficult, but always very fair. The pure vessel gives more than enough time to react to his attacks, so once you're used to them, it's incredibly satisfying defeating him. Basically all of his attacks can be punished in some way. His triple slash and lunge attacks should be jumped over and while doing so, you can downward slash him. If he's throwing daggers, you can simply shadow dash through the bottom most one and get a few hits in. And during his soul pillars and circular AoE attack, it's a great time to cast a few shade souls. The only attacks I would advise to only dodge are his counter attack stance and the void tenderus. You can go behind him during his stance and hit him and then shadow dash away, but the range of his slash is huge. Using the Shade Soul during the Void Tendrils is feasible, but I've always found the timing on when he actually whips his tendrils to be very awkward, so I prefer simply dodging it while it's active. And now it's time for the last boss, Absolute Radiance. It took me quite a few tries before defeating her. The problem is the sheer number of attacks. Eventually I got really lucky and had an awesome pattern, but all my deaths were purely due to my mistakes, so I've had fun in all my attempts. The first three phases are not particularly difficult and are pretty easy to learn. Despite having the largest number of different attacks, thanks to the huge platform you'll be fighting on, you should be able to quickly learn them and consistently be able to get past them. Don't forget that by using the Descending Dark spell, you can make the spikes on the ground despawn. I was not using that since I don't mind waiting for the Radiance to teleport away from them. Once you climb the platforms, Phase 4 begins. This is the part I've had most of my attempts sent at. There are so many things going on at once and so little space to maneuver. Eventually I had this attempt, where the Radiance teleports near the bottom platform twice while doing her attacks, which gave me plenty of time to burst her down. 
And now we begin the climb under the constant beam barrage from the Radiance. At this point I felt like my heart was going to burst since I knew how lucky I was getting here. All that's left is to start Pogo jumping on her head and try to dodge all the light orbs she sends your way. I barely managed to wall jump on that platform and squeeze past the forming orb. At the end I got lucky again and landed the final blow just before another orb was about to hit me. And with the final Radiant boss defeated, let's go back to the first floor and all the way to the right where a door was blocking our path. Further to the right is a statue of the Void that creates another Hunter's Journal entry. Let's open the journal and see what it says. And that was all for today's video. I hope you've enjoyed it and I would like to wish you the best of luck if you decide to attempt defeating all the Radiant bosses. If you've liked what you've seen, it would be awesome if you press the like button and subscribe to my channel. And if you didn't like it, you can write a comment below to let me know. Hope to see you again next time and until then, have a good one.